So today I want to give some initial feedback on the first assessment and then some further information on the group assessment. So the, the t-shirt message is really just moving forward from the first assessment. So as I said at the start of the module, it's very important that we get the feedback back to you so that you can then incorporate that feedback into the rest of the module and into the preparation for your next assessment. Okay. Um, but before I do any of that, it's the quiz time. Um, now, the thing about the quiz <coughs> is as well as me understanding to what extent you're engaging with the material, the quiz material is also going to be quite useful when it comes to doing the actual assessments. So for assessment number two, and three and four for that matter, the information that you are reviewing when you're doing the quizzes, the information that you're looking at in the guest lecture videos, are going to be really important when it comes to writing the assessments. So rather than wait until the assessments are due, sometime near when the assessments are due, and then trying to cram in all your research and reading then, you know, Paint me naive and idealistic, I thought we could space it out throughout the entire period of teaching. So, uh, that's the motivation of the quizzes, is get you engaged with the core material and make sure that you're actually um, uh, doing the work. I know you are doing the work, but it's... You know. So, and to spice things up a bit, to make it exciting, we are running a competition. So, how Sari is still in the lead, but the others are catching up. There's been some very good uh, performances. So, one piece of paper. Please remember to write your group name. Those five questions. Some of them, you should know the answers to these already without looking at Guy's lecture. And I'll come round and talk to you as you're doing it. That's really good. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really tired, I'm going to sit down, I hope you don't mind. Um, when and where was the seventh billion person born? <laughs> Just anyone, who, who wants to... Yes. Where, where and when? Okay. Very good. And, w and where? Manila, yes. Um, somebody even got her name. What's her name? Sorry? Yes, right. Um, there were, the, for, for whatever reasons, the United Nations, I think they nominated four or maybe even five babies born on that day as the seventh billion person, just in order to highlight people's awareness of the global population issues. Uh, but they concentrated on that one baby in Manila who was born on the 31st of October. Of course, nobody knows when the seventh billion person was born, but that was uh, what proved to be a very successful attempt to draw people's attention to global patterns in population growth. Uh, what are the two elements of food security? You pretty much got this all right, so anyone can answer. Anything? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? Anyone? Access? Yes, so growing it and then moving it around where it needs to be. So uh, there's more than enough food in the world to feed everybody or to make sure that everybody has a healthy and nutritious diet. Um, so in one instance, the problem with food security is not production, it's the food isn't where we need it. So about one billion people go hungry today and another billion people eat so much that they're actually unwell. So it's, a, it's not just a production issue, it's an access issue, getting the food in front of the people who actually need it. So what's sustainable intensification? This is a, this is a quite potentially broad or vague question. Um, Guy did talk about it. Does anybody want to provide a, a working definition of sustainable intensification? Not you. No, go on then. <laughs> Yes. So in the video, Guy showed that little picture or graph of birds 
birds in the UK countryside and there's this kind of you know, progressive decline as we've increased intensification of our agricultural system in the UK. That means you know, ripping up hedgerows, chopping down trees and copses, uh, monoculture, uh, increasing irrigation, runoff into lakes, more pesticides, fertilisers. That increases your productivity, but it tends to have a massive impact on biodiversity or water quality, things like this. So we need greener agriculture. We need some kind of system by which we can increase productivity, but not kind of trash all the other ancillary services, the ancillary ecosystems which are surrounding our agricultural system, which then segues into what are ecosystem services? So who can give me one ecosystem service, an example of an ecosystem service? Yeah, you can, go, you can go into a forest and chop down a tree. Um, so in, in many, well, a significant number of people rely on forests in order for, uh, in order for the, the provision of fuel, which they use for cooking and heating. So they go into the forest, they chop down a tree, and that wood they will use to cook their food. So then that relates into food security. How about another one? Anybody else? Pollination. Yes, pollination services. So if all the bees in the world would suddenly die, we would be in a bit of a muddle because bees do important jobs of pollination. So it was only relatively recently that I knew that in the United States and other, other places in the world, but I think the US is the biggest market, beekeepers pack up their hives and they will travel hundreds if not thousands of kilometres to take their bees to a farm to then pollinate those crops because the indigenous bee populations can't do it for whatever reason. Sometimes they can't do it because, they're, as you've most probably heard, there's been this precipitous decline in natural bee uh, populations because of a whole series of reasons, maybe pesticides, maybe herbicides or something. Uh, but also they grow crops in places where typical pollinating species don't grow, so they have to import the actual pollinating species, and that costs millions and millions of dollars. So pollinating services are very important. Okay, any more? One more? Last one, another service. How about the very air that we breathe? So um, regulation of the Earth's atmosphere is an important ecosystem service, in a sense. Um, you might think about forests and trees, but algal communities in the sea, regulation of CO2, the carbon cycle. These are much, much longer time scales, much bigger spatial scales, but these could also be an example by which the natural world, the natural systems, are doing things that we all rely on. So Bob Costanza in the 1990s was one of the first people to quantify the value of ecosystem services in terms of dollar costs. Um, so he kind of pioneered this, the discipline of ecological economics. And his first order estimates of how much we derive from the natural world in terms of their goods and services was many, many times greater than global GDP, so trillions and trillions of dollars. And one way to understand that is if you remove these ecosystem services, if you, you know, if bees go extinct in an area, if regulating services that are stabilizing a slope disappear, if you have to then put in place either artificial pollination or you have to stabilize the slope, or you have to manage water catchments, that all costs money. And at the moment, natural systems, ecosystems, do it kind of for free but you need to have a deeper appreciation of what they're doing for you, and then when you're making decisions on how do you intervene in, in natural systems, you know, do you chop down that forest, do you maybe limit the use of pesticides in order to protect bee populations, you can begin to do that in terms of dollar costs. But not all ecosystem services are about dollars, there are cultural services, spiritual services, you know, the value that nature has for us. And how many people live in this um, interface? How many millions? I think everybody got this right. Yes. Yeah, so over half a billion people live in these interfaces between where they're growing things, potentially quite intensively, and you've got relatively undisturbed forest, which is being continually encroached upon. So, excellent. Well done. <coughs> so, you've done assessment one, and I'm in the process of marking assessment one. Um, so I want to, well, the, the feedback will be, I'm going to talk about it now. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have time for me to talk to you individually uh, in this class, but we'll also do it on Friday. 
Uh, and then when we mark the assessment, you'll get an email with the mark and then the specific comments about the questions. Okay? A couple of things I wanted to go over now, though. Um, so one question was, give an example of a negative feedback loop and how does it respond to changes in the environment? So negative feedback. Um, in one context, negative feedback seems to be a bad thing, doesn't it? At the end of some sessions, I ask you for feedback, and if you give me a hard time, you know, you say you're being bored and I'm talking nonsense, and that's an example of negative feedback, whereas obviously I want positive feedback. But in the context of systems dynamics, negative feedback doesn't mean what it does in an everyday parlance. Negative feedback means stabilising, um, goal-orientated, goal-seeking um, kind of association of feedback loops. So, um, in lecture three, I think it was, when I was talking about um, giving you a systems primer, I introduced feedback loops and a negative feedback system in terms of a central heating system. So this is a thermostat which you set to a particular temperature and then there's a, there's a flow of information um, between the thermostat and the boiler. There's a flow of matter or heat or hot water between a boiler and a radiator. And then there's a kind of a thermal flow or radiative flow between the radiators and the air temperature. And then the air temperature uh, is being detected by a thermometer, which then sends an information uh, signal to a thermostat. So that is a negative feedback loop. Okay. This is also another example of a negative feedback loop, but it kind of moves temperature in the other direction. So this is where they have an air conditioning unit, which only comes on when the temperature goes above a certain set value. And so in terms of negative and positive feedback, conceptually it's very, very simple. You can get bewilderingly complicated circuit diagrams or systems dynamics diagrams or schematics of negative feedback systems. If you look at some of the literature on control theory, I wouldn't really recommend it because it's interminably dull, but there's lots of mathematical formalisms around and, and theories and theorems about how you design things which are self-stabilising or have negative feedback. But essentially, here's a negative feedback process. So as the temperature goes up, that has some kind of decreasing effect here. And then, th I beg your pardon, as the temperature goes down, that has some kind of effect on the system, which is your gas boiling radiators, and that's going to increase the temperature. And then the converse for a central heating system. As it gets hotter, the central heating, uh, the air conditioning unit comes on, and then that makes uh, the air temperature colder until the temperature comes back down to that fixed point and the air conditioning unit goes off. Right. So schematically, basically they're just interacting. You've got one thing which is increasing something, so B is increasing A, so there's more of B, it's having a bigger effect on A, so it wants to make A bigger. But then as A is getting larger, as A is getting bigger, that has a decreasing effect on B, which then makes it smaller, so then that system will self-stabilise. Self-stabilise in terms of uh, something that's getting hotter or something getting colder, and that's contrasted with positive feedback. And positive feedback in a control systems context is the bad thing, typically. You don't want positive feedback because positive feedback produces this kind of runaway process where B makes A larger and A makes B larger and that goes on and on and on until the thing, well, maybe in a central heating context, the whole thing catches fire and falls apart. So the take-home messages are whenever you see a positive feedback system, whenever you can see in a system dynamics diagram or you can see in some kind of representation of a system that you can see positive feedback, that positive feedback must be limited somehow. There must be a negative feedback loop which interacts with that, which then keeps it into a certain level, or at some point it's going to overshoot and it's going to collapse. So when Meadows et al. published their book, uh, Limits to Growth, their main argument was they can't really see many negative feedback loops they can't really see many stabilising um, processes that are going to stop this runaway growth in people, in energy consumption and in pollution. And in the absence of any of those kind of negative feedback processes, which would interact with those positive feedback processes, the only conclusion is that that system is going to overshoot whatever fixed point it, it could arrive at and then collapse. It would fail potentially quite spectacularly and quickly. <coughs> there is another... Um, potential answer to that question. So if you were to have read the relevant sections in um, Thinking in Systems, 
Donella talks about stabilising loops or balancing feedbacks, which are related and obviously similar to a negative feedback loop, um, but I wasn't asking specifically about this. That said, if you didn't really talk about negative feedback loops in the context of thermostats, but you instead just talked exclusively about stabilising or balancing feedback, then that's fine too. Uh, the example that she gives in the book is, um, well, she gives a couple of examples. One is a hot cup of coffee on a, on a cold day. So over a period of time, that hot cup of coffee will equilibrate its temperature with the air temperature. So the, the temperature of the coffee will slowly come down. One of the reasons she did that is because she was contrasting it to positive runaway reinforcing feedback which produces exponential growth. So that was one of the questions and I think you all pretty much got it. The idea with exponential growth is that the rate of growth or the rate of change of the system is not constant. The rate of change is actually increasing. So every, as you're going forward in time, the amount that's being added to the system is getting larger and larger. The larger the amount that's being added, then the larger the stock. And that means the larger the stock, the greater the amount that's being added. So there's a positive feedback loop. And with exponential functions, even though you might start with very, very small amounts, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 32, 64, you keep on enumerating that doubling, which you do here, when it's 2 to the power of x, then pretty soon you end up with astronomical numbers, because every time it's doubling, okay? Systems like this can take off. They can take off relatively unexpectedly, so you're not really keeping an eye on it, you're not monitoring it, and it seems to have a very low level, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this system is taking off, and it's, an, it's, um, it's manifesting exponential growth. And so, there are portions of population growth, total population growth, uh, in the last century, around 1970, 1980, where the population was experiencing this exponential growth. In fact, some people argued it was hyper-exponential because it was actually increasing at a rate greater than um, a kind of an exponential function would predict. Tremendous increases. So she was contrasting that positive reinforcing growth with uh, the hot cup of coffee, which over time becomes the same temperature as the air temperature. And that's the inverse of exponential growth. So one way you could look at this is it's an exponential function that runs in reverse. So imagine that time is going this way. So just like an exponential function, it would start off very, very small and then suddenly shoot up. But now let's go back into normal time. So you know this is in the past and this is towards the future. So you start off with some value and the rates of change initially are very large. So if you have a hot cup of coffee, initially the temperature changes will be typically large <coughs> and then it slowly becomes into balance with, let's say, the surrounding air temperature um, and for many systems that have these um, sorts of stabilising uh, loops, you actually never reach that value. And the technical term is their asymptotic functions. So the asymptotic function is like the inverse of the exponential function. So you would see initially very large changes, but then over time those changes get smaller and smaller and smaller until they, they become vanishingly small. They kind of smooth out. So in that respect, there are two possible answers to that question. I wanted you to talk about negative feedback loops in the terms of, you know, um, this increases this and that decreases that, maybe in the example in the context of um, central heating systems, and that's fine. If you talked about it in this context, and that's fine also. Um, so if you've got any questions about that, then I'm more than happy to answer them now, or you can wait until you get your uh, feedback email. Right. The other question um, was hysteresis. Now, I talked about hysteresis in the lectures. She doesn't really talk about hysteresis explicitly in the book, so I've talked about hysteresis a lot, and most probably some of you are quite bored with hysteresis already, right? And so, at danger of belabouring any points, systems that exhibit hysteresis have these uh, bistable <coughs> properties. So you can increase them, and then they will can suddenly increase, and as you then try to decrease them, you don't go back the way you came, you're on this kind of upper limb, and there's also another decrease here. And that arrows, or if you were to follow the particle round, or follow the values of the, of the system round, it describes a hysteresis loop. Now, it's important to remember, or to note, is that here I've denoted these kind of sharp, what we call bifurcations, 
You don't have to have these sharp changes for a system to exhibit hysteresis. Some systems, um, like uh, classic examples in magnetism, uh, the, the, the magnetic dipoles are pointing one way, and it seems to be a very smooth progress, uh, but then when you try to reverse um, the moments of the dipoles, when you try and switch things around, you realise that suddenly it's resisting. You've passed this point, but this is actually now a smooth system. It's a smooth curve. So you don't need necessarily to have these sharp discontinuous changes um, in order to see a system that exhibits hysteresis. But I wanted to give hysteresis in this context because it demonstrates hysteresis, also demonstrates these sharp discontinuous changes, and the unpleasant thing about hysteresis in natural systems is they can have these sharp changes, so you can't see the change coming. All of a sudden you're somewhere um, which is very, very different from where you, where you were previously, and now you can't get back. So it's kind of sharp discontinuous change plus hysteresis equals a nightmare to manage or to deal with. And that's a classic example of what we call these tipping points, so tipping elements in the Earth system. Uh, a tiny input, a relatively small input, is sufficient to push the system somewhere where it's going to be very, very difficult to get back. Um, and I've shown you the plot from Tim Lenton's um, National Academies of Science paper, Tipping Elements in the Earth System. Um, there seem to be quite a few of these. The more we look for them, the more we see these potentially um, hard to recover from systems that have these kind of tipping elements. Right, <coughs> so that was assessment one. Uh, so, we're going to use the things that we've learned in assessment one for assessment two. So, assessment two, if you go to the website, there is the final version, which is pretty much the draft version, but I've folded in question two into question one or something. So, question one is now, describe the perfect storm and then sketch out its systems di dynamics diagram. Um, the second question is, then once you've got that kind of verbal description and your system dynamics representation of the perfect storm, then can you see any potential feedback loops? Are there positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops? Um, does anyone talk about tipping points in that system? If there are any tipping points or any kind of hysteresis that might complicate our management or interaction with the system? And then in the third one, I want you to argue whether or not we're going to be able to navigate that perfect storm. So Beddington's motivation in saying by 2030 bad things could potentially happen was to raise people's consciousness and get people who are responsible for you know, food security, energy security, uh, water security to put in place the things that we will need within a relatively short period of time. So in that question I would like you to argue as to how confident or optimistic you are as to whether or not we're going to do that. And if we're not, then what could be the consequences? What could be the consequences for you maybe some people who live in other portions of the world right now, or maybe for future generations. So it's, um, it's a free form, it, it's a much more flexible answer. I've given this a word limit, 1,000 words. 1,000 words is, I think, sufficient for 25% of your module mark, okay? This isn't 50% or 75% or you know, it's a quarter of the mark that you will be awarded for this module. So, it would be quite easy to assess the module just with this one report, because it kind of captures all the bits and pieces that we're interested in, but, as I said, I want to space the assessments out so then we can learn from the feedback on the assessments and then incorporate them in. So rather than one big bang of an assessment, let's space them out. <coughs> so please bear that in mind. I certainly think that you could get a report that would get top marks in under 1,000 words. I don't think it's going to be particularly challenging in that respect. Um, so just think about the word limit and scaling your ambitions and the kind of material that you want to cover, the kind of arguments you want to make. So it's not really many words, but it's only 25% of the module assessment, so um, please bear that in mind. And assessment two is about this thing, this thing called the perfect storm. And in a way, this is almost giving you the answer, or certain elements of the answer for question one. So draw a systems dynamics diagram. Well, it's kind of there, you know, there's bits and there's some arrows. In the first instance, you've just got to annotate those arrows. So where the information flows, where the material flows, what is interacting with what, what's affecting what. And importantly, how do those impacts have an effect on us? Um, I think it was last week I was drawing those kind of feedback diagrams of pollution, so externalities. 
And ultimately, to do something with an externality, in order to make an externality an internality, it has to affect the people who have something to do with that pollution. There has to be a feedback loop. It can't, the, the interactions or effects can't terminate in some cloud or sink where it becomes somebody else's problem. So Beddington is very motivated to try to show the interactions and the interrelationships between these challenges as not different, disparate, separate things, but as kind of being different sides of the same sort of challenge. And that's ultimately in an anthropogenic context. So he's, he's trying to motivate us to do something about it because it's going to affect us. And if it's going to kick off in 2030, then it will affect us. Maybe in, um, it may have larger impact on future generations, or maybe not us in this country, but our people in other portions of the world. But it's trying to close that feedback loop. And that was the motivation for the planetary boundaries context. You know, the, one of the reasons this has got so much traction, it's not saying there's an inherent value to um, the climate or there's an inherent value to the nitrogen cycle. I mean, can anyone really get passionate about the nitrogen cycle? I suppose I can after a few drinks, but generally people are not very animated about the nitrogen cycle. But if the nitrogen cycle could stop working or stop working in ways that we've become accustomed to, then the impacts on us would be very, very significant. So this is all about pushing natural systems beyond the point by which they stop doing the things that we want. And Guy Poppy's video talked about that in the context of ecosystem services, so we'll talk about ecosystem services a bit later. That's not the only kind of framework that we can understand it. I mean, the very broadest context is, you know, what is the value of biodiversity? Uh, what are the values of um, atmospheric chemical pollution? So some of the guest lecture videos are, in a way, directly addressing those issues. So we talked about um, food security. The video lecture I want you to watch for Friday will be Felix, who will be talking about biodiversity in the context of ecosystem services. So who cares about biodiversity? Why is it important? Well, there might be a number of reasons to believe that if we deplete our natural stock of biodiversity beyond a certain threshold, we're going to be in an awful lot of trouble. Uh, the resources for the second assessment, just like the first one, are going to be on the module webpage. So, if nothing else, start there. <coughs> and then the second assessment, um, which I'll talk more about on uh, the third assessment, sorry, the group uh, poster, I'll talk more about that again on Friday. In the meantime, I really need you all to look at that URL. I need you to look at the tutorials um, resource to make sure that you're happy with how you would go and produce a poster. So it's like the technical nuts and bolts. Have you got, yes? Um, what do you mean having the description for those subjects? Because a lot of them you can't get the description. Lots of the temp, yeah. yeah. So being a tight ass, mm -hmm. I haven't paid for any bolt subscription to pick the chart because if you pay, um, you can upgrade your account to a pro and then you get like a bazillion different templates, which are really cool. Um, but I don't have the money to do that for everyone. And also, I didn't want people to get... I mean, in a way, I'd like it if people did get carried away and went nuts with it. But I've looked at the templates you can get for free and they all look sufficient. Okay, so um, that's what I decided. It would be one or two thousand pounds or something just for the module and it's hard to justify that. Um, so again on Friday I'll talk about the fact that we're motivating this by s saying every group member's got a particular section and I've said that I would like each group member to supply three references for their particular section. So that's just three peer review pieces of work that you need to uh, cite. So if there's six of you, you've got 18. This bit's important Log into Blackboard, and I want you to check that you are in the right group. I think you are. I need you to check, and then I need you to update that group description with what you will actually be doing for your group presentation, okay? Does your... Hang on a minute. I've got two more minutes. Don't fidget. I've got... Uh, some people have asked me about the presentation and the poster. No, it doesn't have to be about a different topic. It can be about a subset of your uh, presentation or something much larger. I've updated the assessments page. Remember that the motivation, both in the poster and in the project, is this kind of message and medium. That's why I wanted you to look at this. This is a really nice article. 
Uh, I know Michael, and he's my editor, and he also interviewed John Shepherd, who gave one of the guest lectures about climate change. John's constant frustration with people not being able to understand or engaging with some of the science. Last thing, plagiarism, I need to remind you about. Go to the university definition of plagiarism. Um, I was very clear that I did not want any citations, or I didn't require any citations for assessment one, because I've told you what the material is, right? my first three or four lectures and that section of the book. But you cannot, under any circumstances, reproduce by copying and pasting any text. One, because I don't know if it's actually original work. Two, it wreaks havoc on the plagiarism system already. And then three, I can't quantify, I can't assess to what extent you've actually understood the material that you are presenting. For assessment two, you will have to produce uh, references and also you have to supply a bibliography for your poster presentation. What counts as, as something citable or referenceable? Not Wikipedia, unfortunately. I use Wikipedia a lot. I think the visualizations, the graphs are fantastic. So if you want to use a Wikipedia figure, that's great. But you always need to relate it back to the source, OK? Which isn't particularly hard, because usually you'll see a footnote, and there's the, uh, the original literature. So just bear that in mind. And the last thing, there's been some changes to the schedule. Um, so we're over here, we're going to do biodiversity, we're going to do more on assessment two and the presentation stuff. I think I'm going to give a lecture on week eight, which is going to wrap some things around to do food security ecosystem services. And then there's some more uh, workshop activities here. The week before we disappear for Easter, I'm going to run a coursework lab on the Tuesday. So that's a, a session where you come in and I will talk to you individually about your assessments, most probably your assessment two. I'm not running that on Friday because that won't give us any time. If I've got some feedback, which is, you know, read that, watch that, you're not going to have any time to do it. So we're going to have to run that on the Tuesday session. And at the moment, the report deadline is still uh, the Friday before we break up for Easter. OK? Any more questions or anything else? Come see me now. Thank you. Oh, oh also, sorry. Watch those. It's just two videos this Friday, okay? So there's no actual reading, two videos. Hello. Um,